Uh, Matthew chapter 11, if you have your Bibles, we'll be getting there in a few moments. When I was in high school about 10 years ago, we, we um, I won't get into about that, but there was, um, I, I used to play football, I played high school football. I was, I was, for most of my years in high school football, I was a tight end and a um, defensive end. Um, the problem with that in me was when I was a freshman in high school, I had the same size feet and hands that I have today. I have a size 12 feet and these pretty, they're pretty good size hands, like the sort of mutations that they're not, they're not really fit. They don't fit my body. They're, they're something, I don't know, in the evolutionary process didn't happen right for me there. I, I just, then, anyway, when I graduated, when, when I had these size feet and these size hands as my freshman year, my football coach looked at me and said, this kid's going to be big. He's going he's gonna to grow into those mitts and he's going to grow into those feet. And, um, and, I, and I, I didn't. <laughs> I graduated 130 pounds, about maybe, I was probably about 115 at that time. So I wasn't real big. So in my, by the time I got to my senior year in high school, they moved my position. I, I became a cornerback and a wide end, but I played mostly cornerback. Cornerback was when that guy sits way out in the corner. They cover guys that, that go out to pass. But we, in my league, they didn't pass that much. So I really became like a guy that mostly tackled people that ran around my side. Now, here's the problem. If they made it to me, it was already too late. Because people were supposed to make the play before that. They had these things in football called pulling guards. You, know, you might not know what a pulling guard is, but a guard a guard's a guy next to the center who hikes the ball. They're usually the biggest land masses on the field. Now, a pulling guard back in my day, in my high school team, was probably about 200 pounds, and I weighed 130. So there's about a 70-pound difference, and that's significant. You ever run into a 70-pound difference? It's significant. So my job was when the people ran my way, and they always would because I weighed 130. They figured they could mow me over, and they could. And then when they, they, came, they ran my way, these pulling guards would be out there and be running back behind the guard. My job was to take the guard out so the other people could come and, tack and, and, and get the, the actual guy running with the ball. So I would have these um, collisions that would, um, I'd always get the, like, the worst part of it. Now, I want to back up a little bit. Because before we took the field, we were in the locker room. We always had this one coach, and he'd get in there, and he'd give us this. We'd all be ready, and we'd, we'd warm up, and he'd give us, we'd call it being psyched up or fired up. He'd give us this speech. These people are coming in to your locker room, into your house, and they, and they are like from Al-Qaeda. And, and, they, and they, want to, uh, they want to ravage your country and destroy your families. And they're mocking you and making fun of you right now as we speak. So you're like foaming at the mouth. Ah, 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 I want to kill them. And, uh, and so then we run out the field and we cheer. Ah, and we jump to the little hoop thing. And the cheerleaders are cheering. The band doo -doo -doo -doo, uh, playing. And, and, um, and, and we jump on the field. And the game starts. Then I meet the pulling guard. <laughs> and and um, so I'm all psyched up. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Footprints. R right over me. Cleat marks. Dirt all over my shoulder. All that emotion I had in the locker room departed just like that. It, now it was survival of the fittest. I just wanted to live to see the next day, because I knew that pulling guard would be coming back in two or three plays, especially because that one went for 50 yards. So I knew it would be coming back for, for two. So I, I went, my point of motivation changed. That's my point. That's what I'm getting at. When I left the locker room, I was so excited. I was going to win this. I was going to crush anyone that came my way. No one was catching a pass next to me. I was going to take this and intercept every pass that came to my side of the field. Nothing was going to stop me. That lasted about 30 seconds. Once the game started. First time somebody popped me, that was it. My motivation changed. Same thing happens in our Christian life. We have this sometimes as a new convert or at certain points in our Christian life, we have this point of motivation that is fleeting. If we've been in maybe in a, in a church camp, a youth camp, Brian could tell you this, Pastor Brian, that you, they come out of a youth camp or a men's retreat or a woman's retreat, and everyone's like, yeah, I'm so excited I made these decisions for Christ and this decision for Christ. And they last for two, three, four weeks a month, sometimes for a lifetime, but oftentimes it begins to wane a little bit about a month later. Or we come out of a church service on a Sunday morning, that's it. 
I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to do that again. My life is changed forever. Then I meet the devil at the office. <laughs> or my, the guy next to me in the office, same thing. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and everything I happened and all that, like, wow, on Sunday morning is gone. <laughs> and it's back to survival of the fittest. <laughs> what happens? That's our point of motivation. Oftentimes, uh, T.J. Jake said this, your beginning zeal or passion will likely not be your ending zeal or passion. What thrusts me into the world, what thrusts me into my Christian life will most likely not be what gets me to the finish line. Sometimes we can leave a, a men's group or a woman's group or a service and we think we're going to take on the world and, and my life has changed forever. But the problem is the other people in my life aren't changed forever. And the pressure is still there, and the workplace is still there, and my past is still there, and my weaknesses are still there, and my temptations are still there. And so I, that point of motivation wanes because it was the wrong point of motivation. So the question I ask myself, and I ask myself this all the time, really what is driving me? Is it the law? I'm not talking about the law of Pinellas County. I'm talking about the law of thou shalt and thou shalt not. Now I'm a Christian, I don't do this, and I'm supposed to do this, right? And that's the, I reduce my Christian faith to that. Is it, the law, is it guilt? I did what I said I would never do again. Or because Jesus did this for me, now I've got to do all this stuff for him? Guilt? Or pride, or it's just really the umbrella of the two things I just talked about. A debt service, what do I mean by debt service? Sort of the same thing as guilt. Because God did this for me, now I'm supposed to do this, right? Let me tell you something about grace. Grace can never have a price tag on it. And grace can never send a bill in the mail. The grace of God can't say, now that I've saved you, you've got to do this. Stay with me. I'll balance this a little later on. Grace doesn't say that. It's grace plus nothing. It's not grace plus my obedience. It's not grace plus my service. It's not grace plus um, my activity. Not grace plus my commitment. It's grace plus nothing. When I give presents to my children on, on Christmas, I do not require anything from them, but they receive it. I don't think that my children are going to be more obedient the day after Christmas than they are the day before Christmas. I've just given them grace. I've just given them a gift. So when Christ gives you the gift of eternal life, it's just that, a gift of eternal life. Well, Pastor, does that mean I can live like crazy after that? I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there needs to be a point of motivation for your transformation. Let me read you this quote by Arthur Pearson. Help me, Dr. Lewis. Didn't Arthur Pearson replace Spurgeon? Was it Pearson who replaced Spurgeon in his pulpit? Or, I, you know, some of Yeah, let's say it is. They won't know. Yeah, all right. <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> After preaching a message on, on, on grace of God, the gospel in his church, this is his quote. He goes, I sink back exhausted in the vain attempt to set before this congregation the greatest mystery of grace that I have ever grappled with. I cannot remember in 30 years of gospel preaching ever to have been confronted with a theme that more baffled every outreach of thought and every possibility of utterance than this theme of God's glorious gospel. In light of that, a verse we quote to you many times, 1 Corinthians 2 Verse 9 says, I is not seen nor ear heard, neither has even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. Now, I've taught you many times that verse is not necessarily looking towards heaven, even though heaven would come under that umbrella. 
that verse is talking about the work of whole, the Holy Spirit of God in your life, in your inner man. It's not talking about your outer man. It's not talking about where you're going to go, where you die. It's talking about the work inside of you. Unto him, Ephesians 3.20, again, a verse we use a lot, who can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ever ask or think. That is an internal verse. That is not an external verse. It's not talking about God doing a bunch of stuff through you or for you. It's talking about the work of the Spirit inside of you. Just like Pearson brought out. Let me read you the quote by Elton Trueblood. I had this on Facebook this week or two ago, so you might have seen it. We need to understand in our generation is that Christianity is much bigger than we want to suppose. We are engaged in a big enterprise, the enterprise of changing the world. The real heresy is not some failure in some detail of theological belief, but that which by we trivialize the Christian undertaking. It is real tragedy to make it little when it ought to be big. It is a terrible sin to make people think the gospel is equivalent to the elimination of some minor vice or anything negative. Let's look at that sentence. He called it a terrible sin to reduce the gospel down to something like, well, you better not do that, and you better stop doing that. True blood calls that a terrible sin for anyone to preach that and anyone to really embrace that in the gospel. Because you know what it's done to the gospel? Made it incredibly cheap. It's taken the gospel of Christ, I'll get back to the quote in a second, and shrunk it down into human level, and shrunk it down into human comprehension, and shrunk it down to human behavior. It's taken a glorious gospel, so great a salvation that Paul calls it, and, and taken down and made it so man-made. That's why he called it a terrible sin. A Christian in Christ's sense is not marked by little habits which he does or does not have. But, it's, but it is by his willingness to share in the radical undertaking of a change in man's heart and a consequent change in human history. So he's saying, this is my point. This is what True Blood's saying here. The Christian in Christ's sense is not mocked by all these little things I battle with, and they're real battles, they're real things we confront in our flesh and our past and our, our depravity package. But to understand something bigger than that, that when I became born again and I became sealed with the Spirit, something incredibly radical took over inside of me. Christ's life himself his righteousness, his redemption, his regeneration, his life being coming my life has taken over me. It's a radical undertaking. We make the mistake by taking our Christian life and, and judging it by what's out here instead of what's going on in here. We'll see a little bit that, more of that in a moment. Now, the Christian life was never intended to be casual. It was never intended to be part of our life. It was never intended to be something, yeah, I'm a Christian, I go to church on Sundays, type of thing. The Christian life was meant to be consuming. Not necessarily in our schedule, in our time, but in our inner life. Matthew chapter 11, verse 11 and 12, the English Standard Version says this, Truly I say unto you, among those born of women, there has been arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Difficult verse to translate. If you were to research that and look up the different people, you'll find three basic translations for that. People approach it different ways. 
I'm going to approach it what I would call the majority way because it's the way I've always understood it, and it makes sense to me. The word suffer violence is biazo, and it means to, to enter by force, to forcibly advance. To force, so the kingdom of God forcibly advances. I'm not talking about having a militant Christian church. So the forcibly advancing is not, is not taking over land territory. Obviously, it's talking about a work inside of man. It's forcibly advancing inside of you. In the Septuagint, the old Greek New Testament, Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament, this word um, biadzo is used to mean breakthrough and harpazo. It means, well, you know that word, that's the word they use for rapture, to snatch or to seize. So the kingdom of God snatches you, it seizes you, it pulls you out. It takes you away in a sense. So what he's getting at, he's saying, Jesus is saying, look at this new dispensation's coming. This new day when we'll no longer be under the law, but under grace. And just a short period from now, there's going to be this day called Pentecost. Where the Spirit of God is going to come from heaven and start indwelling all those who believe on my work on the cross. No longer will there be an unresting spirit, but it'll be an indwelling spirit. No longer will faith, will, will our Christian life be obedience to some set rules or standards. It will be an issue of the heart. And I'm going to take over men's hearts. It's, I'm going to advance into men's heart, and I'm going to take over territory that was lost to sin. I'm going to take back territory that was lost to trauma. I'm going to take back territory that was lost to bad decisions. I'm going to buy back years that were lost to poor parenting. I'm going, to, I'm going to recapture and remake and, and, and breathe new life into areas that were dead. I'm going to cause a resurrection to go on in people's hearts and minds and souls. I'm going to transform them from the inside out. Religion will let spend all their time spinning their outward, outward wheels. But this new Christian faith, me sending my spirit into them, it's going to change them radically from the inside out. If that is true, and it is, shouldn't that be our starting point? Shouldn't that be our point of motiva- motivation? So my Christian faith isn't reduced to getting some vice or addiction out of my life. It isn't reduced to all of a sudden having a more consistent behavior. It's not reduced to having a great family, even though great families are a gift from God. My Christian faith is having a radical undertaking, a transformation inside my soul. That Jesus Christ has me, has my heart, and has my soul. And he's making me something and doing something in me I never thought he could do before. To a place that maybe five years and ten years and fifteen years and twenty years down the road, I will not recognize who I used to even be. Still not connecting anything to my outward life. You know why I don't do that? Because I could be in a bed of sickness and I can't get out and do anything. I can be laying on my bed of sickness so tired I can't lift my head and so sick as maybe my, my physical life ebbs away and have just as much of my, my spiritual life as anyone on the mission field preaching the gospel in the third, first, fourth, fifth world. It doesn't touch the outward life. doesn't touch it. The outward life is a fruit of it. So, so many of us, we... we um, hold on to what I call plastic fruit. Who grew up in New England? In New England, all good weather stops already. It's already done. And um, so good fruit is um, done. Unless you have a lot of money, you can't buy good fruit in New England. It's just the nastiest weather up there. The only thing good up there is the baseball team. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so, and so and somewhere about November, you get, you get um, plastic fruit. Whose parents had plastic fruit on the table? Mine did. Never understood it. 
And, um, and you see the little ridges, there's bananas, there's a little horn there, the little horn. And they have like apples and oranges and bananas and sometimes a radish or something. And it was all, it was all, it was all plastic. Because, they, they, I don't know why. I, I, I wouldn't say because, I don't understand it. But it was plastic fruit. <laughs> Every now and then you get a really good piece of it. Where people actually thought it was real. But most of the time you can see the little ridges on it. You knew it was plastic. And a few bite marks from people who were bad, bad, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't see very well. And, um, and so that's sort of Christian. We have a lot of, lots of plastic fruit. It's me saying, I'm going to do this to prove to God I'm serious. I'm going to do this to prove to other Christians that I'm serious. I'm going to do this to prove to myself that I'm serious. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to act this way, behave that way. So I feel really good about myself. And I feel then that I can come up before God and say, yeah, pretty good, huh? <laughs> I know, I have it happening. And uh, I know, I know, you're happy I'm on the team. I'm happy I'm on the team. We're all happy I'm here, God. Uh, I, I get that. No. God isn't, he, God, don't get me wrong, he's very happy you're on the team. But it's not because of how you play the game. It's because of what's inside of you. The gospel is pretty interesting. When you look at the, when you look at the gospel, it was given to, what, 12 ordinary men. Twelve men that fished and they collect taxes and they did all sorts of ordinary stuff. Very weak men that would deny Christ, doubt Christ. And then again, that moment in Acts chapter 2 when he sent the Spirit inside of them. Something radical happened to these men. They didn't have all the understanding right away. As Peter shows, we've tracked Peter's life. He didn't quite understand it, but something radical. And they went on to say that these 12 men, these 12 ordinary men, turned the world upside down. And my friends, that wasn't because of what they did. That was because of what happened inside of them. That wasn't their activity. That was the inner transformation as they began to understand the whole scope of this cross. The great scholar Bengal, great um, Greek scholar, according to this verse, he says, the kingdom of heaven exercises force. And then I believe it was Red Path again, or, or True Blood, said this, there is no easy Christianity or no mild Christianity. It is violent or it is nothing. Violent on the outward? No. In here. Something takes place. I'll never waste my time and mental energy figuring out who is saved and who isn't. That's between them and God. And you don't ever go, that person can't be saved. Don't ever say that. Because you just don't know. You just don't know. I don't, I, I'm just going to believe the best. But with that said, if I've been trucking along for a decade or two or three, and my heart's never been moved, never been stirred, never been challenged, never been convicted, never been inspired. And I'm the same guy I was 20, 30, 10 years ago. I'd ask what happened. Because the Christianity I see in the Scriptures, something radical takes place. Now, I'll define radical as even the struggle. Well, Pastor, I still battle with this sin or that thing. I, I get that. That's part, of the, that's part of the radical undertaking. It's things that used to be normal for you. Now they're not. Now you, there's a spiritual struggle going on for that part of your life. And that's a good thing. That shows that the Spirit of God is working inside of you. So we have this point of motivation that has changed. Whatever it used to be, now it can become the gospel. 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, Paul's protege, Timothy, he was going to take place on um, Paul's place. He, um, Timothy was, uh, best we can tell by church history, had his issues. He had his issues with the people of Corinth. They sort of bullied him over. He seemed to have a motivational problem where he wasn't really that active or, or just didn't seem to really want to seize the gifts that God had given him. We can see that from 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. He says, Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.12, lay hold of eternal life. Go get eternal life. He wasn't talking about salvation. He was talking about the life of living with a spirit-controlled life. Lay hold of eternal life, Timothy. Go get it. 
Seize it. Go after it. Then he says here, his last epistle, you then, my child, be strengthened. In King James, or another translation may say, be strong, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So what Paul is saying to his protege, he's saying, Timothy, you need a source larger than yourself. You need something going on inside of you that's bigger than your experience, bigger than your personality, bigger than your temptations, and bigger than your past. You need something bigger in your life. Timothy, there was a radical undertaking that went on inside of you when you were newly saved. Again, I'm borrowing from 1 Timothy here. But somewhere you put the brakes on a little bit. And that work was slowed down. So Timothy, I want to tell you, be strong in the grace. Don't be strong in the need for men's approval. Don't be strong for being pat on the back. Be needing to get a pat on the back. Don't bow, bow, don't bow down and, and, and placate people that are negative, Timothy, because you're always going to have those people. Don't do that. That's what he did in other cases. Be strong in the grace. Because we read later in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that way his strength can be made perfect in your weakness. The word be strong or be strengthened is to be endued with strength or or to receive strength, but what's important is a, is a present tense, which means that Timothy be continually powered. Not this is this is something that goes on for a lifetime. You're continually renewing yourself in the grace of God. You're continually showing up, meditating, thinking, dreaming. Now notice what Paul didn't say. Timothy, get busy in social work. Timothy, go out and feed the poor and you'll be okay. Feed the hungry. Give money to the poor. Timothy, pray more, read more, study more, obey me more. Just say that. Timothy, I want to leave you with this, Timothy. Be strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or I can maybe paraphrase that, be strong in the gospel by our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read you this quote by Oswald Chambers. This is about over 100 years ago. He saw the same misnomer happening in the, in the church at that point. Now remember, Chambers was a, um, was a wartime preacher. He, was, he taught in the tents of the World War I, I believe it was. She says that so much Christian work today has never been disciplined, but has simply come into being by impulse. In our Lord's life, every project was disciplined to the will of the Father. Practical work for the Christians is, is greatly overemphasized today, and the saints who are bringing every thought and project into captivity are criticized and told they are not determined, and that they lack zeal for God or zeal for the souls of others. But true determination and zeal are found in obeying God, not in the inclination to serve Him that arises from our own undisciplined human nature. Know what he's saying there? He's saying, look, it, this isn't about what we do. It's about taking my life and submitting it to Christ. Because if it's about what I do, then the person lying in the bed with, sick and they can't do what I do, would be inferior or living in condemnation or living in guilt or, or second-guessing themselves. Am I, under, am I being judged? Am, is this a product of sin? And, or whatever it is. And what Chambers is getting at here, and he was a, obviously, we want to serve, we want to have outward works, but Chambers is getting at, look at, I, Jesus is much more in tune with your inner life. He wants to see an inner life that's obedient, an inner life that's submitted. Not, not a life that's driven by the outward, doing things in his name. He wants to see a life that's driven from the inward, that is so saturated in his presence, then works natural, nat naturally happen. So the gospel becomes the force that compels us in the Christian service. Ephesians 2, verse 8, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, and it's a gift of God. We all know that verse, great verse. 
great evangelism verse. You're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man could boast. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest... Okay, verse 9. Verse, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Sometimes we don't attach these two together. And you can't separate them. God has... Paul has a continual thought here. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he's saying we are his workmanship. We're actually, the word, Greek word is poems. We are his poems, created in Christ Jesus, our position in Christ, for good works. So are we supposed to do good works? Oh, yeah. God has good works for you to do and good works for me to do. But verse 10 started in verse 8. I'm saved by grace. That good works may be lying on a bed and praying for people. It may be giving of my financial resources for missions. It could be anything. Verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 15 says, But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me, and not without results. For I worked harder than all the other apostles, Paul said. Yet it wasn't I, but God who was working through me by my self-effort. No, reject. I should have reject buttons out there. Eh, no. God who's working through me by his what? I'll say it for you. Grace. Grace. God is working in me through his grace. So the closer I walk with God, the more works gets done through the power of God. We reverse it. We think our walk with God is preceded by doing good works for him. No. I stay close. I stay close in here. I may plug into an outward outreach. I recommend that we do. I do. I pray, I pray one of my times of prayer in the morning that God will lead me to people to share the gospel with. I may not lead it with, uh, just bring people that's obvious that I can share the gospel with. Sometimes it, it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's not really up to me. The fruit is his. But my prayer is God will lead me to people that I will share the gospel with. My meditations, my friends, in the morning is all about that. That's what I think about. I've taught myself to think about that. It wasn't always that way. I used to think about, I better, I should have, I could have. How come I didn't? I wish I had. I wish I didn't do. Maybe I need to do this. And my mind would race as I, as I judged my relationship with God by my own consistency with him. Then I put the brakes on. I said, no, I'm not going to even look at myself. That's a boring picture anyway. I'm going to look at that. And that's going to be my reflection. That's going to be my meditation. I'll close with this. I had lunch, me and Pastor Lewis and, and Pastor Pat Jono had lunch today, and we talked about the gospel, and we talked about our imagination. I, I think this is a, a cool term. Imagination is defined this way. is the ability to form a mental image of something that is not perceived through the senses. And he gave me that definition at lunch, and I had to prove it, and I had to look it up to make sure he was telling me the truth. So it was, it, was, it was true. The ability to form a mental image of something that is not perceived through the senses. Now, my imagination came from God, correct? He breathed life into me. He made me with emotions in mind. He gave me my imagination. That wasn't part of the fall. That was part of creation. God gave me an imagination. Now, I'm not saying the imagination can't get the best of us, and it needs, the imagination needs to be kept within the confines of this book. Our imagination can't out, leave out the realm of scriptures, so I'm not talking about imagining fanciful things, but I'm talking about Ephesians 2, 9. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Eye is not seen, no heart, no eye seen, <laughs> is not seen, no ear heard. Got my body parts mixed up. And that nor has even entered into the heart of man, imagination, what God has prepared for them that love him. Now that has even entered into the heart of man, what God has prepared for them that love him. So imagine your life today without fear. Imagine a life today of, that there is a contentment in your heart. Imagine your life today that's free of intimidation, insecurities, poor self-esteem. 
addiction. Think of that. Imagine it. Imagine Jesus Christ on his cross. Then think inside the realm of Scripture what that cross means. Imagine what it means to walk in the Spirit and to understand Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with him. Nevertheless, I, it's not I, but him that lives through me. I'm not living, it's him that lives through me. Imagine, think about that. I'm using imagination in terms of almost in a synonym with meditation. Think about that. Dwell on those things. Don't dwell on what you're not doing. Don't dwell on what you're supposed to be doing. Don't dwell on what you are doing. Don't dwell on what happened to you when you were this tall or that tall. Don't dwell on the people that betrayed you in the church or outside of the church. Don't dwell on those things. Those are wasted thoughts. Don't, Don't dwell on that. Think about Jesus. Dwell on him. Reflect on him. Imagine a life that walks in the spirit with him. Draw that image and hang on to it. Because the gospel was meant to be violent. It wasn't meant to sit on a shelf and be a pretty picture, a novelty. The gospel was meant to grab you on the inside and transform you on the inside. And as that transformation takes place on the inside, it works its way out to the outside. Dear Jesus, thank you for these words and these precious people. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and have never asked Jesus to be your Savior. We quoted just a few moments ago on the webcast, Ephesians 2, verse 8, where it says, we're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man could boast. Salvation is not going to church. That doesn't make you saved. Salvation isn't having good Christian parents. That doesn't make you saved. Salvation is not giving up certain sins or vices in your life. That doesn't make you saved. Salvation is a free gift. It's something you ask for from Christ, understanding that you cannot save yourself.